Okay, once again, good morning to you all. I hope you're all well and enjoying this autumn weather. Uh, we are uh, technically uh, on a legal holiday today as far as the calendar goes, but I'm happy to see uh, many of you in the room. Uh, those of you who, who are not here are fully entitled to take the holiday, but uh, as you understand, and I've explained, I, I will not rearrange a calendar that's already been very specially rearranged. So rearranging rearrangements is only going to cause confusion. And since we're recording this, uh, those of you who um, who are not here will be able to watch it at your convenience. So everybody wins in that sense. And we can stick to what has now become a fixed pattern for the remainder of the term, namely uh, a plenary lecture every Monday morning at this time. Okay, now, uh, before we move on to Searle, and I have some slides to show you and a bit of context to provide, I think, to enrich really what Searle is trying to tell us about Turing and about the imitation game, uh, I uh, was uh, interested in some of the reactions to Sophia last day, uh, and or last week, rather. Uh, in particular, one of you, I don't know if she's in, in the room with us today, but one of you commented after watching this five-minute clip of, uh, of Sophia being interviewed uh, that the whole, that, that, that uh, she found, some, one of you said this was, was quite unsettling. That was the word, unsettling. Um, so if, uh, if that person's in the room, it could tell, tell us what was unsettling about it, or if anybody else was... Was, was slightly unsettled by Sophia. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about why. If everyone's happy with her, that's fine too. Any comments about, uh, about Sophia? Did you all take her in stride? Or were um, any, of you, uh, any of you just a little bit perturbed by her? Yes, please. So on YouTube, I saw some videos on her, but on the comment section, it says behind the scenes, it, it's kind of fake because someone else is controlling the robot behind the camera. So I don't know if that's true or not. Can you like confirm that's true or yes. if it's that's false? Yes, Abdul, I've, I've confirmed this already and I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to reiterate to you that, and as the interviewer said himself, if you look at the interview again at the end, he was partly surprised because he recognized that she had come up with certain things uncoached. In other words, from her own uh, internal processing, she was able to, uh, let's say, extemporize or converse in a quasi-normal way. Some of it was scripted, some of it was scripted, and she is, uh, I think, uh, connected. She has a wireless connection, and I think she can be coached um, while she's in the process of being interviewed. She can be fed certain answers. So it's a bit like a sophisticated uh, ventriloquist dummy, if you like. Okay, uh, I'm tempted to make a political comment here, but I won't. Uh, but in any case, uh, she, she looks like words are being put in her mouth at times. Um, on the other hand, she's still able to come up with certain things unaided. So she's a kind of a, a halfway house, if you like, uh, between uh, what Turing would have definitely applauded and said, well, there we go, that, that, you know, that's a huge pass of the imitation game, right? She's passed with flying colors. And what we know to be, as you say, Abdullah and rightly, and as critics have said, she's, she's really a kind of a ventriloquist dummy and not as independent as she appears. But certainly um, her vocalizations are, are pretty amazing. Her facial expressions obviously are mimicking those of humans. And she does have some sensors or an array of sensors which allow her apparently to recognize the facial expression of others. So this is the primitive kind of... Uh, uh, if you like, simulation of mirror neurons, and she's able to express emotion um, in a primitive way. So it's a, a big step forward if you consider that to be progress, right? Definitely. Um, so anyway, it just reconstitutes the whole debate about robots. So um, we'll, we'll be seeing more of this uh, in the future, not less because there's a market for it, there, there is finance. She was presenting at a, a conference of investors, remember? She was soliciting investments, I'm sure she succeeded. Hanson Robotics will be building more of her and more advanced prototypes 
and we'll have these things in the market, uh, I'm sure, before very long, given the accelerated pace of technology, okay? Um, presumably, we'll still know the difference between them and us, um, but uh, then again, um, that, that could also change. So um, she's pretty much state of the art. All right, we're going to, are there any questions about touring? Any other questions or observations about touring before we move on to Cyril this morning? Is everybody happy with, you know, with your understanding of what touring was saying back then and how much of it has come to pass and how much of it still has yet to come to pass and so forth? All right, from silence, I, I infer that everyone is happy or that everyone is at least satisfied with, with, with what we've covered and, uh, and you're ready to move on. Is that right? Shall we move on then? I said more silence. Okay, well, yes, okay. Some of you are saying yes, thank you. I appreciate the feedback, okay? There are enough of you in the room. I, I need to know, okay, we're ready. So we will move on. And I think that this uh, will be very interesting for us. It, it's uh, the last uh, lecture in our first segment of the course, and we'll tie together a lot of what we've already looked at. And Cyril's allegory certainly is still much discussed. Once in a while, philosophers come up with something which has a tremendous impact on people in the field and people in allied fields. And you can find online a great deal of discussion about the Chinese room and its implications. And we're going to look at some of that this morning. That's our challenge. Cyril disagrees fundamentally with Turing and also with Churchill, and as we'll see, about materialism. So I need to give you some context before we actually look at the allegory of the Chinese room, which we're going to do. But first, a bit of background, which is not in the Cyril reading itself, because obviously Cyril is assuming, I mean, Cyril is a, is a, is a very experienced and well-seasoned philosopher. He's assuming a certain amount of background knowledge. So let me just share with you uh, a screen which uh, is intended uh, to convey to you some of the background terminology and concepts that uh, Cyril is assuming uh, that we're familiar with, okay? So let me try and share this. We'll see if uh, Zoom is behaving this morning. Um, it appears to be. I say it appears to be. I have something here that looks like it might be right. Uh, I want the PDF, however, um, and I'm not seeing, the, oh, there's the PDF, okay, fine. Uh, so everybody sees this, right? Three kinds of AI, yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so th this is a more modern kind of uh, terminology. Remember, Cyril wrote this paper around 1980. We're in the 1980s, so it's already quite old, 40 years old. Uh, and he was distinguishing between what he called weak AI and strong AI. Now, those terms are still in circulation, but they've been modified slightly. So I'm giving you the sort of state-of-the-art terminology that pertains to today. Uh, it does no violence to Cyril's argument. It just locates it in a newer framework of terms. So we can distinguish now three kinds of AI, uh, whereas Searle was really distinguishing only two. Uh, firstly, narrow AI or weak AI, AI being artificial intelligence, right? Okay, don't, don't uh, if you fail to capitalize the I, you'll, or the A and the I both, you'll produce a word AI, which is actually uh, an animal, an AI is a three, an A, AI is a three-toed sloth. I just mentioned this in passing, but if you capitalize AI, then it becomes um, an acronym for artificial intelligence, all right? If you don't capitalize it, you're talking about a three-toed sloth, okay? So anyway, we have narrow or weak AI, and uh, what Cyril's calling weak AI is what we today call narrow AI because it's dedicated to a single purpose. It's AI that is designed to do one specific thing or one sort of specific thing that may entail a small cluster of other tasks. But basically, there's one overarching goal. And we have a lot of those in current circulation. Chess programs are among the first or other kinds of games and that, you know, they, they play games with us, whether you have apps on your phone. They're all examples of narrow AI because they're doing one thing pretty well. Chatbots are all examples of narrow AI and uh, they're all geared to, you know, to take you down a particular path. 
um, and hopefully hook you up in the end with a person if you need to, or point you to a website once you identify your problem, et cetera. Um, and like the one on your phones, which whose name I will not mention without waking her up. Okay, so you know who I'm talking about, SIRI. Um, and autopilots, they've had these for a long time in airplanes that continually get better. But the autopilot is still narrow AI. It's, you know, the plane is loaded with sensors and the autopilot is taking in all this information. And its job is basically to maintain the attitude um, and altitude and speed of the airplane until otherwise directed. And they do a very good job of this. And sometimes a plane can be saved from a crisis by switching it to autopilot because it will stabilize the flight. Whereas perhaps there may be some problem in the plane that uh, prevents the pilot from doing it. But anyway, autopilots work pretty well, or we wouldn't be depending on them so much. And now self-driving cars are also uh, autopilots of a sort. M note, that's more difficult. Why? Um, an airplane is vastly more complicated than a car, but you don't have the kinds of traffic in the air that you do on the freeway, so or the throughway. <laughs> so we need autopilots to, to navigate. You know, you don't have pedestrians running out in front of airplanes at 36,000 feet. So once you're on autopilot and you have good radar, you know pretty much how far away other planes are. And there's collision warning subroutines now when planes get too close in flight. You know, everyone's warned and they're even told to take what action to avert a collision and so forth. Uh, but we need a lot more on the ground when we're when we're driving cars, right? So that's why it's taken longer to develop self-driving cars and self-flying planes, interestingly enough. So we have a whole array. Anyway, we, we encounter every day and cannot avoid encountering a whole array of narrow AI devices. And they basically fulfill the purpose to which uh, they're consecrated and they can be modified in order to do it even better. And Searle acknowledges this, of course. Um, they're, they're basically tools which help us do tasks, whether they're apps um, or, or other kinds of bots. They help us to achieve some purpose and no one can argue that they fail to do this by and large. Okay, secondly, uh, is this category of general or strong AI, what's so called strong AI, is now called general AI. And it, it, that kind of AI would be able to do many things well. I say can do many things well. We don't really have such an AI. I should have said could do many things well in principle. For example, uh, if we had this, so this is hypothetical. If we had a strong, a strong AI device that were fully functional, it could pass a Turing test much like Sophia is able to, you might want to say fake passing a Turing test with some coaching, right? Um, would be conscious and self-conscious. Uh, uh, can or would be capable of understanding. We don't really have these things yet, uh, but they're definitely on the drawing board. And it, I mean, it's a matter of speculation as to, as to when these stronger or strong AI or general AI devices will really emerge. And uh, that's something that, that we're waiting to see, but we don't really have them yet. And what Searle is saying is that we're not going to have them. And he has an argument as to why. Um, and even if we do have them, he says they will not be the same as humans. We'll come to that, of course, today. Uh, but, but Turing thought we would have them. Yes, I mean, passing a Turing test in, in the strongest sense, which is the most general sense. Could you sit down with a computer and have a kind of heart-to-heart -heart talk, just like you might have lunch with your friend and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk? We don't have a computer that can do that yet. Turing predicted that we would. Searle's argument is that we can't or won't, and that remains up in the air. All right, but that's the second kind. The third kind is uh, something we don't yet have, but we've envisioned. And some, and some people are afraid of it. It's called artificial super intelligence. And that's the kind of thing that might give rise to a robot civilization, uh, the kind of thing that's given rise already to a lot of science fiction, where machines are locked into a power struggle with humans and could eventually conquer us if that's what they wanted to do uh, for whatever reason. So there's a, a lot of science fiction out there, there many more movies. You may be more, more, more familiar with the uh, with the, all the movies than I am. I remember an early one and a very brilliant one called 2001, A Space Odyssey, made in the 70s. It's Stanley Kubrick, the late great American director, who teamed up with uh, a science fiction writer uh, whose name is Gase me at the moment, um, but a very good one. And they, they produced uh, this movie together, which is really interesting. It's, it's a power struggle between a super intelligent computer 
uh, and the uh, astronauts on board a, a spacecraft, and they're basically in a power struggle over the mission. And the um, and the supercomputer is actually starting to kill off <laughs> the crew uh, because it uh, it thinks that the crew is sabotaging the mission, and the crew thinks the computer is sabotaging the mission. So they get into this uh, power struggle. This is very interesting, They're very interesting indeed. And they talk to this thing, and it tries to figure them out psychologically. Uh, it's a great uh, concoction of, of the superintelligence. We don't have this yet, and we're not even close to having it. Uh, but last day, somebody did mention, and I forget which one of you it was, but last week, at some point, somebody asked in a very, very prescient question as to whether it would be possible for robots to manufacture themselves uh, so that they could become independent of us. And I, you know, that got lost in the shuffle, but I just want to tell you that that was also, uh, that was also predicted uh, by, uh, in fact, John von Neumann, a great physicist, uh, a polymath, really, uh, who uh, was uh, ultimately at Princeton for many years, invented game theory with uh, the economist Morgan Stern. He pioneered many things. And he also wrote a seminal paper uh, called, uh, it was really about self-reproducing automata. So John von Neumann envisioned a distinct possibility that we could in fact one day send a kind of super robot with a super intelligence to an asteroid. Let's say the asteroid was rich in raw materials like iron, other, other metals, other things that we would need. You could send up a super robot, uh, a super intelligent robot, well-equipped enough that could build a factory up there out of existing materials that it could find and, and refine and then could start assembling robots in that factory. So it could, and then would be able to program them as well. So it's just almost like science fiction, except that it was a technical paper, merely predicting that one day it would be possible actually to design and produce these self reproducing automata. So that reads like science fiction, but it was actually just a prognostication about future possible engineering that we could end up doing. And then the segue or the sequel to that was actually another very brilliant physicist named Freeman Dyson, uh, who I think just died. I've met Freeman Dyson a couple of times, he's a very interesting guy. And Freeman Dyson took it a step further and he actually drew up the blueprints for NASA to design a spacecraft that would allow us to go to an asteroid and start mining it. Of course, it was too expensive. I mean, setting up a space colony uh, was not feasible when Freeman Dyson was doing it on the drawing board. But he, like von Neumann, assumed that technologies would evolve where one day it would become feasible. And if so, he, he actually designed a kind of a prototype of what it might look like. So these things are, are in the offing. Did he think of the Dyson sphere? Yes, David, excellent. Uh, yeah, that's named for Freeman Dyson. He was a, a very far-sighted uh, physicist, a very imaginative physicist. So he, 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 he took everything at least a step further in theory as to what kinds of things we might be able to do in space. Uh, so there you have it, okay? Uh, we, don't, we don't have artificial superintelligence yet. And if we do, then yes, we might have robot politicians and we might have a robot civilization trying to conquer us. I mean, all the science fiction stuff, which is now just sci-fi, could come to pass. Okay, but don't worry, don't lose any sleep over it. Arguably, we'd have to be able to solve the general AI problem before we get to the super intelligence, right? And we haven't even done the second thing yet. So that's still a ways off. Okay, three kinds of AI. Now, to but relate this to Cyril. Um, and uh, yes, Abdullah, I agree with you. I mean, technology keeps getting better and better. And so, you, you know, that objection uh, that, that Turing raised and answered back in 1950, that, oh, yeah, we'll never be able to do such and thus, you know, the, the inductive argument that we'll never be able to build a machine to do X, Y, or Z, that's been proven false time and again. So it's, uh, it's probably safer to assume that one day we will have a machine that can do X, Y, or Z, definitely. But I'm just saying uh, that we don't have one yet, okay, for whatever reasons. Uh, so what is Cyril doing? Cyril gives us his allegory, the Chinese room, um, and he accepts weak AI. I mean, that, that's a given. Uh, but he refutes the possibility of strong AI. He's, he's not, not only saying that uh, we don't have strong AI, but that we can't have strong AI and that perhaps we won't, there, there are some fundamental reasons why. Cyril's central claim, if you want to boil it down, 
I boiled it down for you. I, I believe his central claim is that a simulation of understanding does not understand anything. So even if we had what Turing would call strong AI and what Turing might say, oh yeah, pa this passes any kind of imitation game with flying colors. You can have a conversation with it about anything and the interrogator won't be able to tell whether you know it's talking to a, a human or a computer. Searle's saying, no, 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 we can simulate intelligence or understanding. And even if we simulate it extremely well with strong AI one day, it still doesn't understand anything, whereas we do. So Searle contends that humans understand languages, whatever languages we happen to be able to speak. He says we understand them, but machines do not. They are simulating an understanding. And his allegory of the Chinese room is, is calculated to illustrate precisely that point, okay? So now a little bit of terminology for you. Uh, Searle is therefore a holist. Uh, a, hol a holist is someone uh, who believes that consciousness, self-consciousness, understanding, those kinds of things are not reducible to a complex algorithm. An algorithm, for the, so those of you in, a, in, in doing computer science know or mathematics know that an algorithm is simply a set of instructions, okay? That's what the word means. It's an English word that we, we borrowed from Arabic, actually. It's a, a, a originally just like algebra and, and uh, alchemy and algorithm. All these words that start with AL are usually uh, assimilated from Arabic. Um, it's, a, it's from the golden age of the caliphs that they were transmitted into, into the West. Okay, uh, so in any case, if you're a holist, then you believe that certain things are not reducible uh, to, to a set of instructions. Uh, by contrast, proponents of strong AI are reductionists, yeah? They're reductionists. Yeah, alcohol, a lot of, yes, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, of there's quite a bit of Arabic um, that we've uh, assimilated into English, okay? Thank you, David and Karim, correct. Alcohol and Aladdin. Okay, by contrast, proponents of strong AI are reductionists because they assert that such phenomena can be reduced to a complex algorithm, okay? That consciousness, self-consciousness, understanding, these things are reducible. Note the plural of phenomenon is phenomena. Please don't say phenomenas, it's barbaric. I know that language is being destroyed as we speak, but I'm old school, okay? So, uh, you know, for now, please, we, we got those words from Greek. And the, the, the singular is phenomenon, which some of you may have heard, and the plural is actually phenomena. If you start with the word phenomena, you're already speaking of more than one phenomenon. Uh, one more, more than one phenomenon. If you have more than one phenomenon, then you're speaking about phenomena. And so please don't tack an S onto phenomena and turn it into phenomenas, which is, to me, barbaric. Uh, just like uh, the Latin uh, bacterium is a single... A single one, right? A bacterium. And then if the plural in Latin is bacteria, uh, not bacterias, that's again uh, a sort of barbaric version of English. So uh, please understand the origins of these words and, and respect what uh, some dictionaries still regard as the proper singular and pluralization. Okay, I know language changes, uh, but in any case, uh, phenomena is the uh, plural. All right. Uh, you understand the main point? There's a contrast between a holism and reductionism. And I want to say to you, whatever side of this you end up being on, it's fine. Uh, th there's no proof either way. Uh, and uh, Searle, moreover, argues that there can't be, and we'll come to that. But let me give you a bit of context about reductionism, because it has been highly successful uh, in science. And here are just a few examples. Remember, generally speaking, Reductionism is the thesis that widespread phenomena, again, the plural, widespread phenomena can be explained in terms of, or that is reduced to, more fundamental principles or scientific laws. So when you perform a reduction, you're, you're, you're taking something that has been observed very widely, very generally, but not particularly understood in a more, at a more fundamental level, and you're literally performing a reduction by reducing some explanation or modeling of this very widespread observable phenomenon to a much more succinct and comprehensible model or law 
or, or set of laws. And that gives you a much better handle uh, by having reduced it. It also sometimes allows you not only to explain what's going on, but also to predict what will happen. And some sciences have very strong predictive records precisely because their reductions are quite powerful. And here are a few examples. I just picked a few. All right, Newton's laws model ordinary motion, right? F equals MA and so forth. Um, every, to every, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, that's, that allows rockets to, to, you know, when a rocket, how do you blast a rocket into, into space? How do you escape Earth's gravity? You have to eject enough out the back end in order to propel it forward. And this is all, this all is, is made possible by Newton's laws. Um, if you just throw rocks in the air all day and watch them fall back to Earth, you're not going to develop flight. <laughs> so uh, Newton basically modeled um, ordinary motion by reducing this widespread phenomenon, which everyone knows about, everyone observes and everyone experiences, to certain laws of fundamental laws of nature, very successful reduction. Similarly, Maxwell's equations modeled electromagnetism by reducing all electromagnetic phenomena to basically four equations. And that gave us a very powerful handle on the phenomenon of electromagnetism. And, and allowed us to, uh, to advance um, our applications as well as our understanding. Einstein's very famous derivation, E equals mc squared. I'll bet some of you know this equation, even if you haven't studied physics. It's the only equation ever to appear on the cover of Time magazine. So it's very impressive for that reason alone, if that sort of thing impresses you. It unites matter and energy, and all the textbooks had to change after that. But it also explains to us that the sun is undergoing hydrogen fission. Yeah, the sun's a gigantic set of H-bombs. And that all the stars, in fact, are undergoing, during their burning phase, they're undergoing um, hydrogen uh, fusion, rather. Uh, so essentially, this is a very powerful reduction. It explains a lot of things about the universe. Darwin, moving to biology, Darwin's theory of descent with modification was a brilliant reduction. He never used the word evolution, by the way. People, if you do word association tests, you say Darwin, I'll bet a lot of people will say evolution, um, and they'd be wrong. Uh, that's just because that's one of a thousand uh, false false beliefs in, in common circulation that everybody thinks are true, because they've simply been told them over and over and over again by people who perpetuate the falsehoods. If you read Darwin's first five editions, of the origin of species, which I have read, uh, you won't find the word evolution in there, nor will you find survival of the fittest. But anyway, what he did say was that there must be some internal mechanism whereby he observed all these variations within species, these little variations within birds and reptiles and other species in the Galapagos, and then more widespread, not only, not only uh, fauna, but also flora. And Darwin very brilliantly hypothesized that all these so-called phenotypic differences, the things we observe, must be caused by some internal mechanism, something transmitted within the organism. That was in 1859. Nobody had a clue about genetics, but he predicted the signs of genetics. He turned out to be correct. And then Crick and Watson's discovery of DNA, which is the actual, you know, the, the, the actual molecule that we're talking about, um, enabled gene sequencing. We've now sequenced the entire human genome. It, it, it empowers us in a lot of ways, right? This reduction of why are there, uh, why does is one person uh, look different from another person? What are the specifics of this? Or within a given species, why is there a variety and, and so forth? Uh, we identify now many illnesses caused by uh, mistakenly copied genes, right? And there are now gene therapies on the horizon with CRISPR and many other innovations. But uh, this all comes from the fundamental discovery of DNA, uh, which is the, the, the basic code of the double helix, is the, is, the, is the encoding of all the information we need to basically create from that a total organism. So that's very powerful reduction, extremely powerful. Okay, you get the idea, and science has often progressed this way by making successful reductions. Uh, by contrast, holism is the thesis that not every phenomenon, singular phenomenon, is reducible, uh, or equivalently that some phenomena are irreducible. So that would be a strong version of holism, right? I mean, you're saying some things can never be reduced. Uh, and some of the things that many holists say cannot be reduced are living things, not reducible to non-living things. So you can't get life from, from non-living things. 
we have this hand-waving explanation of how life emerged, right? People who don't like creation myths. We have religions that tell us that God created living things. We have scientific stories, which try to give us an account of the origins of life uh, from non-life through this hand-waving stuff about how, uh, you know, there was a prebiotic soup and there were, uh, you know, the polypeptide chains uh, formed uh, spontaneously because prebiotic soup was struck by lightning or something. You know, all this sort of improbable stories about the accidental formation of polypeptide chains. And then suddenly you get blue green algae crawling out of the sea. Um, um, well, I'm not quite sure it's that simple. Um, and in any case, it's not something that's been done in the lab. Given life, we can clone life, but no one's yet created life from non-life. Uh, minds, similarly, holists would say, minds are not reducible to brains, and um, that consciousness and understanding are not reducible to complex algorithms, okay? So that's a basic account of what holism is trying to say, contra reductionism. Uh, it does not disagree that very significant reductions have been made, uh, but it asserts that uh, there are some things that are irreducible. And Abdullah comments, so this would be contrast to Churchland. Exactly, Abdullah. Uh, Searle is completely opposed to Churchland uh, and, and, and is therefore not a materialist, because if you're, if you're a holist in general, you're going to suggest that not everything that we experience as a phenomenon can have a material explanation. So for holists like Searle, consciousness does not have a materialist explanation, nor does it have a functionalist explanation. So some things are irreducible, and he would be, in fact, opposed exactly to Churchland. Good, good observation. Okay. Um, and uh, none of this can be proved. Uh, what you can do, Abdullah and others, what you can do at the moment is that if you demonstrate a successful reduction, then you've proven that something can be reduced to something else. But if you fail to demonstrate a successful reduction, you're uh, not proving that it can't be done, you're merely failing to do it at the moment. So that leaves a space for a holist to suppose that things are not reducible. As far as I know, you cannot prove irreducibility. What you can do is disprove irreducibility by performing the reduction. But Searle wants to take issue with that. And Searle's Chinese room is saying, even if, we, even if we are able to invent a complex algorithm that simulates human consciousness, it will still not be a reduction. There is still going to be a difference. So that, that is going to be Searle's argument. So he's a sort of steadfast holist. He certainly believes in the irreducibility of things. Okay. Uh, proof is, uh, is a little more tricky, um, but uh, you can certainly demonstrate a reduction. You still may not convince holists that everything is reducible. All right, but good questions, very good questions. Is, uh, is, everything, uh, is everything all right? Shall I go on? Any, any questions about yeah. this? No. We're good? Everyone's clear so far? Yes. Okay. All right, fine. I'm monitoring the chat room just in case. Okay. So I'm glad I have your attention. This is a fascinating area. I think it's a really very interesting uh, way of philosophizing about science. Yeah, what we're really doing here is kind of philosophy of science, uh, which is a big branch of, of philosophy, of course. And philosophers can, just as an aside, we can philosophize about any science. You know, philosophers can philosophize about anything. That's what we do. But since science has made such astonishing progress in the last few centuries, and there are so many sciences out there, the questions that they pose and, and, and are which, uh, w uh, questions which yet remain unanswered by, uh, by various sciences are very interesting, and they're all grist for philosophy's mill, naturally. And, of course, scientists have philosophical interests in these two. Searle's Chinese Room has precipitated a great debate among uh, the artificial intelligence community, uh, and it has a lot of traction uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of what they make of it. Okay, so let's now focus a little more on natural languages because uh, the Turing test actually is based on an ability to manipulate natural language. A natural language is any spoken language, okay? Logical languages, mathematical languages, and computer languages are said to be formal 
languages, all right? But languages that humans speak, which change over time and, you know, which are commonly learned by kids and transmitted from one generation to another outside of formal context are called natural languages, okay? So whatever language you speak or however many you speak, these are all natural languages. So formalism is a branch of reductionism, which holds that semantics or meaning of formal meanings that are uh, of, of claims that are made or propositions that are stated in natural languages uh, are a function of, in other words, can be reduced to vocabulary and syntax. So now we're focusing our reductive versus holistic lens on natural language itself. And uh, for example, if you look at the progress that Google Translate has made, uh, it provides weak empirical corroboration of this formalistic thesis. Because if you type into Google Translate a phrase uh, or a sentence from almost any natural language, they keep increasing their repertoire, right? You could translate from one language into another language. And I trust it for saying things like, good morning, how are you today? Uh, you know, if I go and lecture in a, and I lecture in many countries when I'm able to travel, uh, and I, so I don't speak many languages at all, but if I want to be able to speak to my audience and say, hello, how are you today? Or nice to be here. Or at the end of a lecture, if they like it, you know, thank you very much uh, for your appreciation. I can trust Google Translate to do that, to take a phrase in English and to translate it into, you know, into German or Romanian or, or Hungarian or Mandarin, even though I don't pronounce it very well, or whatever language. I can trust Google Translate to do that. At the beginning, it was less trustworthy because it was much more flawed. It was like a beta version. Now they have pretty much alpha versions and they do a very good job. Not so good with robust scholarly text though. You can't trust it to make good, you know, officially good translations. They're very poor actually because the semantics breaks down. Google does not really understand more sophisticated formulations. It understands basic vocabulary and basic syntax um, and therefore, formalism would say it's able to uh, reduce semantics to those things. But empirically, it only works for very simple kinds of utterances. If you complicate or elaborate or enrich what you want to say, Google Translate will not handle it very well yet. So they weakly corroborate the idea of formalism, namely that semantics can be reduced to vocabulary and syntax. Now some comedy. I hope you're in the mood to laugh this morning. Um, humans can detect ambiguities. Language is full of ambiguities. And sometimes the funniest things that are said by children or, or by others are, are, are unintended, right? Like they'll use, uh, make an unintended mistake or uh, they, will, they will verbalize something which is ambiguous and therefore very, very humorous because there's an unintended meaning, which is the funny part. Um, and this will still escape logical linguistic engines. You could try this on Google. If you type an ambiguous sentence into Google, it will not be able to parse that. It will pick one of the two meanings uh, and translate it, but the ambiguity will totally escape it. And therefore it has no sense of humor, which is one of the things that, remember the objections of Professor Jefferson and Lady Lovelace, you know, they would say, we have a sense of humor, machines do not. Um, and here are a couple of newspaper headlines, which are real headlines. I, I, these were, uh, you know, taken from the internet. These are headlines that were, uh, that are very funny because they're ambiguous. And the person who created the headline, the editor didn't, didn't realize that they were making this huge uh, joke at the time. They published the headline because they intended one literal meaning and they neglected to see the other one. So it makes it very funny. And if you get the joke, you could type in LOL. I just want to make sure that you're awake this morning. So here's a headline. Escaped leopard believed spotted. Does that strike anybody as funny? Yes, Karim. It's hysterically funny, actually, if you have a good sense of humor. Escaped leopard believed spotted. Yes, it takes you a few reads. Because, now you're laughing. Good. I'm, 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 I, I want to see this. Keep it coming, okay? Yes, because you're reading it in one way right? You're reading it initially in the way that it was probably intended. In other words, someone saw the escaped leopard, right? Oh, someone saw it. Someone spotted it. But then, of course, we know that leopards are spotted animals, right? We have a saying in English, a leopard doesn't change its spots, can't change its spots, right? So, of course, all leopards are spotted, meaning that's the camouflage 
that nature gives them. But of course, to spot something also means to see it. So escape leopard believe spotted is perfectly ambiguous. And some of you are laughing because you get it. Okay, now here's my point. If you, so the meaning of this is not transparent because it's ambiguous. If you ask what is the meaning, then the answer is there are at least two meanings. And if you type this into a Google Translate and ask to put it into some other language, it's by definition, by default, it's going to pick one of the meanings, probably the obvious one, and it will not be able to parse the ambiguity. And therefore, we would say it's not intelligent because we can do that, okay? Sometimes you need to be told that it's ambiguous. What about the second one? It's a little more subtle, uh, but equally funny. Girl becomes Methodist after delicate operation. <laughs> this always cracks me up. A Methodist is a denomination of, uh, of, of you know, um, right? It's a religious denomination. And uh, she, became, she becomes a Methodist after delicate operation. Well, what does that mean? Why is, what was intended? What was intended was that presumably the operation was, was risky or, you know, it had some risk attached and, and it was successful. And because of that, she expressed her, her renewed faith or her gratitude to God or her relief in whichever way she felt happy about the outcome that she converted to Methodism. Um, but, but the ambiguity is, if I have to explain it, it's not funny, right? If you have to explain a joke, it's never funny, but I'll explain this one. So the implication of the ambiguity is that the operation itself changed her into a Methodist, right? That the surgeons changed her into, by virtue of operating on her, they turned her into a Methodist, like there's an operation for this. No, of course there isn't. Okay, maybe that's going over a few heads. Think about it, all right? It's not a Baptist, it's different. Look it up. Okay, Hillary, uh, look it up, please. Um, okay, the third one, and I hope everybody gets this right away. Uh, police stoned in Hartford. That's a headline, okay, a newspaper story. Police stoned in Hartford. All right, what, what are the two meanings we would attribute to this? What's one meaning? Yeah, drugged is one meaning. That's not the meaning they intended. Sure, because we talk about getting stoned, right? Or we used to back in the day. I mean, I'm a recovering hippie. So if someone tells me, you know, that they're stoned, I understand by it that they're drugged. Um, and in fact, in country and Western circles, uh, stone means drink, means drunk also. So it means, it means in some way intoxicated. It's a, you know, it's a, a, basically a synonym for intoxicated and getting hit with rocks most definitely. Um, Asha, 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 if, I can't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Karim and throwing stones is, is uh, Aisha. Thank you, Aisha. Um, getting hit with rocks. That's, that's the literal meaning of being stoned. Exactly right. That's a biblical meaning. Okay. So we have two meanings. So what was intended was, I think that, that someone was throwing stones at the police. Um, whereas what was unintended was that the police, you know, got intoxicated. All right. So those are some uh, ambiguous, ambiguous headlines. And what makes them funny is that one meaning, there's an unintended meaning. And the point that Cyril would make, and I'm making this, Cyril's not making this point. I'm telling you that what something means, therefore, if it's an ambiguous statement, then you cannot uh, unequivocally reduce the, you know, you cannot, you cannot perform a reduction such that the vocabulary and the syntax unequivocally tell you what the meaning is especially since there are ambiguities, there are two meanings and we don't know which one was intended. So that would be an argument against uh, this reductive proposition of natural language that you can get meaning strictly from vocabulary and syntax. In fact, there are ambiguities that point to two possible meanings. So you need to know more. You need to know the context perhaps in order to really understand the intended meaning. All right, and that, that's a, a, another point. So I want to tell you something else that uh, the, the robot Sophia supposedly came up with a joke herself. Uh, and this was maybe this has been exposed as a fabrication, but apparently she herself came up with this joke, which is very clever if she did. It's a very clever joke. The, the riddle, what kind of cheese do you use to coax a bear out of a tree? All right, riddle. What kind of cheese do you use to coax a bear out of a tree? And the answer is camembert. 
which is very clever, right? Camembert is a, is, a, is a delicious, fatty, extremely unhealthy French cheese, right? If you want to clog your arteries in a hurry, eat camembert. It's delicious cheese, but very fattening and, you know, full of cholesterol. And Okay, but camembert is how you pronounce it in French, camembert. In English, we'd say the same, camembert. And, of course, it sounds like camembert. Right, so you want to coax a bear out of a tree? What do you what do you say? Come on, bear! Come on, bear! Come on, bear! Right, get the bear out of the tree. Does everybody get this? You guys laughing? Yes, nice. Yes, Roji, it's cute, right? It's clever, and apparently, uh, yeah, LOL, Hillary. Yeah, I think it's very clever. And if if Sophia really came up with this, then she could be the first robotic stand-up comic. Uh, remember, that would be a, a real breakthrough in, <laughs> wouldn't it, in strong AI if we wield a robot or a robot walks on the stage on a comedy club and, and, and delivers a monologue, that would be really something. Okay, so you can imagine it right now, Abdullah, okay. Um, so there you go. Uh, so what about this sentence? Here's a question. Yeah, robot bar, yeah. <laughs> now we're talking about a science fiction story, right? We got a bunch of robots drinking in a bar. Um, and there's a robot comic on the stage. Okay. What about this sentence? Here's a sentence for you. Originally, this is a sentence from Chomsky. I changed the color and I'll tell you why later. But imagine you encounter this sentence. I'm assuming uh, some of you at least are encountering this for the first time. And the sentence says, orange ideas sleep furiously. Okay. Orange ideas sleep furiously. So what does this mean? Well, if we're going to take a reductionist tack, then we firstly would have to identify the correctness of the vocabulary and the correctness of the syntax, and then somehow from those two components, try to understand the semantics, right? Perform a reduction of vocabulary and syntax to semantics. So let's go through the vocabulary. Is orange a word? Yes. Ideas? Yes. Sleep? Yes. Furiously? Yes. So your spell checker, which can only do that would tell you that the vocabulary is correct, right? We're using English words, and each word as a building block of language, each word here is correct. So we would say, find the vocabulary, checks out. Is the syntax correct? Anybody? Is it grammatically, is it a grammatically correct sentence? Yes, David, yes, that's, that's right, it is. I agree. It's grammatically correct. If it's grammatically correct, we should be able to identify uh, what, the, what the function of each word is then syntactically. So as a part of speech, for example, and, and how syntax relates vocabulary, right? Syntax are the rules of engagement whereby we relate one word to another in a grammatical context. A context when you when you get a if you're a computer programmer uh, as I was not not you know I did a lot of that back in the day. Um, and when you when you get syntax error, it means you made a mistake in the grammar. You know you've left out a punctuation mark or you've done something else. You violated a rule, a grammatical rule, so that you can't compile a program. Um, the syntax has to be perfect for a program to compile. And similarly, our, our grammar ought to be perfect for us to communicate well. So uh, what, what part of speech is, what is the syntax of orange in this, in this context? What is it? What part of speech is it? What work is it doing? Orange ideas sleep furiously. What's orange doing? Is it, is it the fruit or is it something else? It's a color, right. And, and, and what part of speech is it more specifically? You understand what I mean by part of speech? It's an adjective. Orange is very good, all right? Adjective, all right? Do you get that? It's an adjective. And it's modifying what? Adjectives are modifiers. What do they modify? Uh, yes, it modifies ideas. Exactly right, Raji. And what part of speech is ideas? It's a noun, right. So you have an adjective modifying a noun. So far, so good. Okay, does the sentence have a verb? Sentence ha ha has to have an a subject, an object, a verb, right? Usually. So sleep. Yeah, the verb is sleep. And it's the plural form for ideas. So one idea sleeps more than one ideas sleep fine and what work is furiously doing what part of speech is that 
adverb correct, uh, it's modifying the verb, right? So the sentence checks out, the vocabulary is correct, and the syntax is correct, grammatically correct sentence, okay? So what does it mean? Here's the question to you. What, what does the sentence, does the sentence mean anything? Orange ideas sleep furiously. Any ideas? Yourselves? What, what, might, what might be the meaning of this sentence? It's not a trick question, I'm just asking. Okay, it's a big sign, so it's, it's meaningless. Okay, so to David, it doesn't actually mean anything. All right, might it mean something? Does anyone have an interpretation? Could it mean something? If David is correct, that is meaningless, and I tend to, to agree that it could be meaningless. Certainly the first time you look at it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't look like it it's, has any meaning, uh, although it's, the vocabulary is correct and the syntax is correct, then it, wouldn't this be a refutation of the formalist view that we can ascertain meaning from vocabulary and syntax? Semantics, in other words, meaning uh, is, is what we can get at um, through a reduction of vocabulary and syntax, it doesn't appear to be the case because in this sentence, we know that the vocabulary and syntax are correct, but they themselves do not seem to convey a particular meaning to us. And it could mean something given context, says Raji. Sure, anything could mean something given context. But if you're not given context, then you might have to suppose that you need context. So the sentence as a standalone sentence doesn't actually mean anything. Right, And that points to some very, very interesting questions in theories of meaning. Because then how much context do you need? And what if the context itself needs context? Are we going to be led to an infinite regress? Or at some point, are we just going to assume that something means something? Or are we going to assume it doesn't mean anything? It's a very interesting question. And Searle's allegory will raise exactly this kind of question. So I just wanted to say, I changed the modifier orange. The original sentence, which I think was Chomsky's, uh, said green ideas sleep furiously. So if I change orange to green, if I now wrote a sentence that said green ideas sleep furiously, that is not as meaningless as it used to be. Because that sentence, green ideas sleep furiously, was, yeah, Chomsky, right. That, that, that sentence, green, the sentence, green ideas sleep furiously, was concocted before the environmentalist movement. So now we associate with green this notion of environmentalism, right? So, and we know that green ideas could be interpreted as having the meaning of ideas about environmentalism. And if green ideas sleep furiously, a lot of environmentalists are very angry about the environment, right? And are, and are being active, politically active, and in other ways active to try to bring about changes uh, to, you know, to ameliorate the, the, the situation. So one could say that green ideas sleep furiously now has a meaning or a potential meaning that we could impute to it, which it didn't have 50 years ago or 60 years ago. That's why I changed it to orange. So it would be apparently still a, a kind of a meaningless utterance, okay? So Karina says, what if the phrase means something else in another language? For example, we use I love you to express love in other languages in various ways. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's more complicated because then we're depending on, on translations once again, which is always a more complicated thing. It is possible, Karina, I think it's a great question. It seems to me possible that a sentence that's meaningless in one natural language could become meaningful when translated into another. Yeah, definitely. And, and vice versa. A sentence you know, that's meaningful in one language could become meaningless when translated into another. And we also have to be careful about how we translate. Yeah. Because, I mean, I speak French fairly fluently, so I can tell you that there are all kinds of mistakes that an English speaker would make just knowing vocabulary and syntax, but not semantics. For example, in English, if I say, um, I am cold, right? In English, I'll type it in, right? I am cold. Now, we understand what that means. I mean, I'm saying literally, it means like the ambient temperature, I need to wear a sweater or something, right? I'm cold, meaning I'm feeling cold, right? 
Okay, um, so that would be the, the normal meaning in English of I am cold. If you translate this literally into French, okay, it's je suis froid. And that's, that is saying something very different. One of you is repeating to me, je suis froid. So what does it mean? Whoever just spoke, you speak French. So what does it mean? It's, il fait froid, no, just, j'ai froid is what you would say. If you want, not it's cold. It's cold is il fait froid. But if I want to say that I'm cold, I would say j'ai froid. J'ai froid. J'ai froid, mm. okay? Meaning I have cold. That's a different way. I have coldness, j'ai froid. If you say je suis froid, which is the literal translation, it means you're sexually frigid. Okay? <laughs> That's what je suis froid means. Nobody says that in France because there probably isn't anybody who is. But I mean, if you said it, if you said that in French, you'd be saying you're frigid. Okay? Very different from saying you're cold, right? So that verb, if you use the verb to be, you're saying something very different. In English, you use the verb to be. I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy. We use the verb to be, right? But in French, you have to be much more careful. You have to use a possessive. You use the possessive verb, I have cold, meaning I'm, I'm feeling chilly. Okay? So it is interesting. And this is and the same with Spanish. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mastiel. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing, right? So uh, el mismo. Yeah? El mismo. Uh, so... Uh, because they're Romance languages, they have a similar uh, root. Uh, lo mismo, si. Gracias. Lo mismo. So basically, um, what we're talking about now is, is a, a, so meanings can change, but this is only going to reinforce Searle's point and be an argument against the formalist point, that if you simply translate vocabulary and syntax literally, you can end up changing the meaning of something quite drastically in a different language. So meaning is not, therefore, simply a function of vocabulary and syntax, because we can maintain a parallel vocabulary and syntax from one natural language to another, but we could end up saying something we did not mean to say whatsoever. Uh, and therefore, we have to learn context or idiom or nuance. And that's not specified simply in a dictionary, right? Not specified in a grammar rule book. And meanings change. Meanings change. Also, uh, Wittgenstein uh, talks about this a lot in his philosophy of language, that meaning ultimately becomes a function of usage. However, people use a given word. Uh, if it's if it's in popular enough and sustained enough usage, then the meaning of that word is defined by its usage and not by any other unchangeable authority. So meanings change over time, which they do. And you can think about that. A lot of meanings of words have become different than they used to be. Uh, so you have to think about that. Meanings are somehow more slippery, more malleable, uh, whereas vocabulary and syntax may indeed be more fixed over time. Okay. So this question of meaning is a very interesting one, and it leads to a very big conversation in philosophy of language, which is basically a little bit of what we're doing this morning. You can't escape that if you're going to look at Searle. All right, so those are some uh, considerations of, of, of context itself for the Searle reading, a sort of meta context for Searle's allegory. So is everybody okay with this um, vocabulary we've developed, the distinctions? Uh, you know, among among the three kinds of AI, the notion of reductionism versus holism, and what it's claiming about human consciousness, the successful reductions that, that we can see in science, but the claim by holists that some things are not reducible, and, uh, and, and, and how that plays out in natural language with ambiguities and uh, nuances of translation and so forth. Okay, is this all clear? So far, so good? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Aisha. And uh, interesting, uh, Raji. Yes, this is all very interesting. I mean, if you're interested in philosophy of language itself, this is interesting. And of course, we're talking about a bigger topic. We're really looking at the uh, Searle's argument that the uh, the hard problem can't really be solved, that, that, that consciousness is irreducible, or at least understanding is irreducible. Okay. So if everyone's so, so far so good with this, let's move to the actual allegory of the Chinese room. And uh, to do that, I, I prepared um, another slideshow. Um, oh, Zoe's got a graphic of outer space here. I like it. Okay, got constellations and, and planets up there. That's really nice. That happens to be showing on the screen at the moment. 
Uh, all right, so here is what I prepared for you in advance as well, is uh, some illustrations that will depict the Chinese room. If you haven't read it yet, I'm gonna go through the illustrations in our 15 minutes remaining in this, in this lecture and explain in, a, in, in, in my own words what the Chinese room is and abet that with the illustrations. Uh, and then questions will arise undoubtedly questions will arise and we'll be looking at those. Uh, you'll be looking at them in your breakout lectures uh, and uh, our lecture on Thursday as well. We'll take up some of the questions that are being raised by this. Let me endeavor to share the screen again. Here it is, Chinese room. Okay, does everybody see this? I'm sure everybody does, yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so what Cyril is saying is the following. Suppose you have a room with an agent inside. This is a person, okay? Um, these are two drawings depicting the allegory just a little differently. And outside the room, you have, we suppose, someone who understands Chinese, okay? Can write and read Chinese, okay? We're supposing that. Now, if any of you in the class happen to be Chinese, if any of you are able to read or write Chinese, you have to change the name of this allegory from the Chinese room to a language you don't read or write. So if you read or write Chinese, but you don't read or write Greek, then pretend it's a Greek room, okay? Or, you know, a Polish room or some language, pick a language you don't read and write, and that's the name of that room for you. But for most of us, presumably the majority here does not read or write Chinese, so we can use Chinese as the language. Uh, to illustrate the thought experiment, right? It's a thought experiment. So imagine this room. And outside the room, there's a, a Chinese uh, speaker who uh, write, reads and writes Chinese, and they put in a question in Chinese. And inside the room, this person inside the room only has two things. They have a, an instruction set. They have an, an algorithm. And the algorithm says, look at the symbols on the page and match them to your database. You've got a catalog here, okay? So every symbol on the page is like an input, and the instruction you're following is look in the catalog until you find that input, and then you'll see a matching output, right? And then that is what you reproduce. The, you reproduce the output on a piece of paper, and you hand that back to the person outside the room. They walk around the room for the output, and then they'll get the answer to the question, and they'll think you understand Chinese, but actually you don't. It's a simulation, right? It's a simulation. So this, to be clear again, this person is only following instructions. This person's equipped with a catalog, which matches, we'll say, hypothetically, all possible inputs in Chinese. Every question you could write down, for example, in Chinese on a piece of paper would be associated with an output in that catalog. All you need to do is study the input, do a search until you get a match, when you get a match, when the input on the, you know, the input paper matches uh, in the catalog, you look at the associated output, you produce that output on a piece of paper and hand it to the person in the output side of the room, and that will be the answer to the question. And the person outside the room will think that what's ever going on in the room understands Chinese, right? Because it asked the question in Chinese, it got back an intelligible and probably a correct answer in Chinese. So the inference of the person outside the room is that this room understands Chinese. Where Cyril, where Cyril is saying, uh, the room doesn't understand Chinese at all. The room's just following instructions, processing data. It has a database, it has an instruction set, and the room does not understand Chinese at all, but could simulate it. But a simulation is not the real thing. What Cyril is saying that the person who really understands the language really understands the language. Whereas what the computer is doing is it's producing a simulation of understanding the language. But that's not the same thing as understanding. Is this clear? That's Cyril's claim. Is this clear so far? Yes, it is. Okay. Now it's a very interesting claim. And we're going to elaborate a little more, show you an example of how it works, okay? So there's a difference. And what Cyril is saying in general, I mean, this is a specific example using a language, but Cyril's more general point is that we can always draw some distinction between a simulation and the real thing. And that however good a simulation is, it's not the real thing. And some examples, so I'm going to type that word in because that's a, 
That's the operative word, right? Simulation. For example, when we have class in, on campus, if I could type simulation. Okay, so for example, we can simulate a fire. We have fire drills on campus, right? You're in, sitting in class, remember? Suddenly you get this really loud alarm going off, very painfully loud, blinking light and a loud alarm, and everyone has to vacate the building, right? You all, you all have to, order in an orderly fashion, we make our way out the nearest exit and wait for the all clear to come back in. What are they doing? They're simulating a fire. It's called a fire drill. They're not simulating a fire, but they're simulating what we should do in case there were a fire, right? It's called a fire drill. So we're simulating our behavior in a fire, more, more specifically, but nothing is burning, right? A fire drill is a simulation. Nothing is actually on fire. Um, we have flight simulators. Flight simulators are really important for training pilots because they can put a pilot in a flight simulator and then f simulate all kinds of problems with the plane, problems with the weather, problems with communication with the ground. You can train a pilot to react correctly uh, to all kinds of stimuli, which are not normal, but you're never risking any lives, right? So a flight simulator is a really great simulation, for, except for one major factor, which is that it never leaves the ground, right? I mean, you can simulate taking off and landing in a flight simulator. You can simulate a thunderstorm. You can simulate a hurricane. Um, but it never, yeah, turbulence, exactly. Uh, but it never leaves the ground. I mean, the thing isn't flying. So a flight simulator does a great job of simulating flying, but it never leaves the ground. So there's a huge difference. It doesn't go anywhere. When you get out of the flight simulator, you're exactly where you, know, you're where you started. Okay, so a simulation is not the real thing. You get this? And, sim and similarly, Cyril is saying that a simulation of understanding language is not the same thing as understanding language. Uh, you can simulate understanding without any understanding going on whatsoever. Okay, so that is Cyril's point about simulations and the difference between a simulation and, a, and the real thing. So here, here's another, just another illustration of the same thing. You've got someone sitting here. In this case, the input comes in on a, you know, on a monitor. Someone typed it in, okay? You got the input on a monitor. You got the rule book, the instruction set, in other words, and you have your database here. And then you, you, know, you follow the rules, you get a match, you produce the output, and you drop it in the output chute. And whoever is outside, the Chinese speaker in this case, got, got an answer to the question. So they assume that the person inside or the agent inside or the computer inside understands Chinese, whereas in fact, there's no understanding. Here's an example I pulled from the web. Um, this might be something uh, the input would come in. Okay, Chinese question outside the Chinese room, writes down this and inputs it. The, are there any Chinese people in the, any, anybody in the, uh, among you read Chinese? Anybody here this morning read Chinese? Yes? Okay, so could you tell us what this says to you? Or does it say anything? I'm okay. assuming it does. Uh, yes, uh, what brings you happiness? Yes, it wants to know what brings happiness, right? That's, that's what the internet told me. I don't read Chinese either, but it says, so if you didn't read Chinese, I mean, we know you do, um, but if, if it, I mean, for the rest of us, we don't know what it means until we're told, right? Because it's a language we don't read. Okay, so it happens to be a, a legitimate question in Chinese, and it's put into the Chinese room. And then inside the Chinese room, what's happening? This is Cyril's a thought experiment, right? So the person in the Chinese room or the computer for that matter compares the input in a database. If you see this shape, followed by this shape, followed by this shape, which is what you're seeing, okay? Those, those six shapes, okay? You find a match in the database. It says then produce this shape followed by this shape. So you produce the output. You found a match with the input. You then produce this output. So you produce this output and then you hand that out, okay? And uh, uh, that output uh, is the answer to the question. And would you, could you tell us again, please, Kuhn, what, what does that mean in, uh, in English? A little bit different. Uh, what to bring happiness and the rather character, rather color. Yes, it and may not be so the, clear. Yeah, I uh, get to the rather characters. What um, does, doesn't make sense. The, the, yes. one, the red colored characters. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what the internet told me is that it's a quote from Lao Tzu 
uh, on the Tao Te Ching, and it, it says, be the stream of the universe. Oh, the, the red color ones, right? Okay. But I, in I, any case, it is some kind of an answer to the question. And uh, there were at least that's what the internet told me. Again, I don't read Chinese, but that would be an answer to the question from coming from a great Taoist philosopher in China. And essentially, if you handed that piece of paper out, then suppose these two people are Chinese speakers and you've done all this stuff again in the Chinese room and you get an answer and you, you, you know, through the process, the algorithm, right, that you followed, the algorithm, you hand that out as output and then they're going to conclude that whoever or whatever is in that room is an intelligent Chinese speaker, right? Because they put in a question, they got an answer in their language. And uh, yes, says Kun, thank you for confirming. It's like passing the Turing test. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's definitely passing the Turing test. Uh, so Turing would claim that the Chinese room passes the imitation test in this case. Absolutely. Searle is going to disagree. Searle is going to claim that a simulation of understanding Chinese is not the same as understanding Chinese that there is a distinction between simulating understanding it and understanding it. And Aisha says you would agree with Cyril. Uh, a lot of people do. Why would you agree with Cyril, Aisha? You have a particular reason? Did something jump into your mind? Well, I just know that like reading Chinese and like translating it through a book is not the same as fully comprehending and understanding what Chinese means. Because a book can translate it in one way, but I know like languages wise, like sometimes books or dictionaries or whatever, they don't just translate it properly the way you would learn it from like your um, grandparents. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe that Surly is right. Okay, so meaning is something deeper than the dictionary and the grammar book. You're basically uh, yeah, taking that side point. that you, you can't simply reduce vocabulary and grammar to meet. We don't get meaning just from vocabulary and grammar. We get it from a richer context somehow. Okay. Maybe it's a cultural context. It's a big, it's a, it's a richer context. Uh, so it can't just be a computer algorithm. So some of you are agreeing with Cyril for that reason. You're not alone. Certainly there are a lot of people who, who do agree and I partly do agree myself. Although there are next day, we're going to look at objections. Needless to say, this is a thought experiment by a philosopher who's trying to push his claim. And uh, obviously, as you know or not, we've done enough philosophy now. That you'll know that there are objections to everything. Any, anything any philosopher claims can be objected to. Other philosophers will come up with objections. So there are objections that can be made to the Chinese room. But they're a little shocking, perhaps. But we're going to look at those on Thursday. Uh, during our breakout lecture, and I'm sure that you will be looking with your instructors uh, at some of the objections to the Chinese room, which are very, very interesting and cogent. Uh, so I think that there is a strong point that Cyril wants to make here, uh, that it's true in general that a simulation is not the same as the real thing. But uh, I'll just highlight two of the objections. I'm not going to explain them today. We'll discuss them on Thursday. I'll be uploading, as usual, both lectures this week for those who want to, to see them. But the f one objection that, that would be made uh, is very, a very powerful one. It's an objection from behaviorism. And it's a way, a, a way of objecting to Searle is denying that anything understands, <laughs> that, there isn't, that there isn't any understanding anyway, that we're making a mistake when we think we understand something. So, so therefore, it's not the case that a simulation of understanding is not the same as understanding, because understanding itself is not understood. And in fact, it's a misnomer. Uh, people would say, who, the, the behaviorists would say to you, this is a, an objection from behavioral psychology. I'll explain it more next day. A behaviorist would say, look, when someone says, good morning, how are you today? And you respond, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? The behaviorist would say, you didn't understand what that person said to you. You're just replying. You, you, what happened is you have, a, you have an English room in your head. Okay, and when someone speaks to you in English, you are matching their input to your database and you find a match and you are outputting to them the reply that is normally and standardly given. So when someone says, good morning, how are you? If you have an English room in your head, then you're simply going to say, oh, uh, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? 
because it's input output. Uh, so it's just behaviorism and there's no understanding necessary. So every time you speak a language, basically you're creating that room in your head. If you speak five languages, you got five rooms, one for each. Okay. That's one objection. So there isn't any, any such thing as understanding itself. And, and Turing would say, you know, that, that, that's what, pretty much what Turing would say. That's a great question. Um, that if we can replicate this to the point where, where no one could tell the difference, then we've succeeded in simulating thinking, whatever thinking is. Remember, Turing's point is that, you know, as a functionalist, we only need input, internal state, and output, and we can simulate thought with that. And so this passes a Turing test, and therefore we've done our job. We don't need to understand understanding in order to do that. Remember, Turing avoids the, the hard question altogether. Okay. So anyway, I want you to think about these things. I mean, sir, it's brilliant. What Sir came up with here is truly brilliant. But one objection is that nobody understands anything anyway, that we're just signaling to each other. Uh, and that's, that signaling is a kind of behavioral way of exchanging input and output. And I'll explain that in more detail on Thursday. Okay. So we're out of time for today. I, I, I know this has been interesting. I, I think it is. And I know that you're engaged with it from the dialogue we've had minimally here, at least in the chat room. Uh, so good for you. And uh, remember, it's all coming back to this fundamental question about Descartes' notion, right? Remember Descartes said, how do we know the wax is the wax? It's because we have this faculty called understanding. And so Searle is also kind of Cartesian, right? He's, he's supposing that this thing called understanding uh, is such that it's not reducible. Um, so anyway, Descartes would probably agree as well. Okay, uh, have a wonderful day. And think about Searle. Read what Searle has to say himself. If you haven't already done so, please. And uh, I will see some of you on the breakout session on Thursday. And the rest of you uh, will continue with your instructors and, and delve a little more deeply into this very interesting allegory. You're more than welcome, everyone. Have a wonderful day. You're more than welcome. And uh, we'll see you all uh, soon enough. Next Monday, we begin a new segment. We're going to change the topic. We've, we've looked a lot at epistemology, ontology, philosophy of mind, philosophy of computing. We've done a lot of work in that area this five weeks. Next week, we change the topic completely, and we're going to look at a, a, an equally, if not more urgently pressing set of topics that deal with ethics and justice, okay? So get ready for that. We'll be looking at Aristotle next Monday and his Nicomachean ethics, and that reading is in your textbooks, okay? It's in the required text. So anyway, have a wonderful week, everyone, and take good care, and I'll see you soon, okay? Bye-bye for now.